next workshop in a series of workshops. This is Workflow Part 2. I'm your host, Eric Torres, an instructor here at CAN-TV. So thanks for tuning in uh, to our session today. Um, last time we talked a lot of jargon, a lot of preparation about workflow and what that means and good ways to prepare to edit. So this is really a workshop for, you know, diehard, serious, you know, editors out there or budding editors who are really giving serious thought to like, how can I actually make this work? And how can I uh, edit something that's kind of complex? Um, you know, because edits do end up being complex if they're, especially if they're longer projects. Um, so that's what this is all about. Now, last time, just we're gonna do a quick review. Um, last time we talked about creating a plan. Uh, that's where it all starts, Your the, the, the idea. It, you know, that comes in your head, the gestation of an idea and the form that that takes. Um, you know, so we were talking about log sheets, we we're talking about edit decision lists, outlines, a lot of good stuff. Here's a uh, log sheet, for example. Um, a log sheet, as you may recall, is where you just kind of put down on paper, you know, everything that you've shot. I've got log sheets coming out of my, you know, what, you know, here, as you can see, this is a project I've been working on recently. Uh, it's I can make like this paper if I if I attach these together, it would probably go to the moon and back. You know, this is like a lot of <laughs> a lot of stuff. This is um, elaborately notated, you know, sheet after sheet after sheet of you know shots, and it's organized. You know, I talked a lot about organizing last time, so. Um, this, well, you need to know what the project's about before this will make any sense to you. So uh, the project <clears throat> had to do with uh, all, you know, everyone's favorite topic these days, which is COVID, uh, COVID-19. Um, actually, you know, not really. We wish we could talk about something else, but that is what dominated everyone's news, you know, last year. It continues to dominate the news, which I'm happy. I'm glad it is because we need to keep thinking about it. But, um, you know, it's been a year now. It's been just a few days more than a year since the COVID-19 um, uh, virus uh, unleashed itself on the world uh, en masse and became a pandemic. So um, last year, as soon as that happened, I decided I'll just pick up a camera, I'll start documenting, and later on I'll figure out what to do with the footage. You know, I figured this is important. This is his history. This is a lot of... These are a lot of important things that are happening. It's a serious topic. I don't want it to be forgotten. Um, so I just started shooting everything that caught my eye with my little camera. That's why I have so many log sheets. There was a lot going on last year. Um, so a phrase kind of struck me. It was uh, how they say uh, mitigation measures. Mitigation measures are being taken to blah, 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 fight against the the virus, the propagation, you know, so I like that phrase. So I decided I'm going to use that as my title. So that's the title of this piece. And um, only recently, really, have I started to put it all together in my head. A few, like a month and a half or so ago, I came up with an outline. But before I, sh you know, I get deep into the outline and, and the steps that follow after that, let me just finish off this review, this quick review. Um, you know, because last time, before we even get into, into actually sitting here at this computer and trying to, to create an elaborate sequence on a timeline, uh, the planning really should happen for a project like this. Uh, your project might be a lot simpler, but even so, you can, you can maybe boil this down into a simpler form, and it's all about what works for you. Uh, this is what is so far working for me, and I'm following the advice of the professionals because I, I'll be honest, I'm not a professional editor. I, it's, I've been teaching myself along the way, so really this has been a learning process for me um, to take things to this level, and I just want to share with you the things that I've learned over these last few months because it's been a real grind, you know, just the process of doing a project this big. 
So basically what I'm saying is, you know, the, or the, the, the process of organizing your material is, is really important it's, and it's very helpful. It seems really boring at first, but, um, you know, some of what we talked about last in the last workshop was, was let's face it, it was boring. So we talked about uh, naming conventions. Um, naming conventions is basically good ways to name your footage, um, your materials, your audio recordings, et cetera, your graphics. So having good practices, and I, you know, I'm following a sort of a system that I sort of devised for myself where, you know, I call things by uh, their general type of footage that it is. Um, so it's video, for example, or it's audio. And then maybe the month it was created or the time period it was created in, so the month and the year, and, and then maybe some, uh, an actual name of that material. So sometimes that's done for every single clip that you record. Other times, no, that's just too much. That's too much work. So sometimes it's good to just, if you have a batch of clips, a batch of material, and they all fall under a certain topic, you know, like I was just holding up a minute ago on my log sheet here, um, I have footage of all the murals that I shot in Pilsen, for example, that had to do with Black Lives Matters, uh, Black Lives Matter. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of murals popped up everywhere on the street, and so I recorded a lot of them, and so I've, I've got them, you know, listed. I didn't have to list them all separately like this. I could have just made one line saying, you know, 18th Street, Black Lives Matter murals, and maybe a general description of a, a couple of the murals. You know, that, that could work too. So really, your system is what works better for you, not my system. So you would come up with your own system, but to have a system, that's what matters. Um, to have some kind of a system, because look at this, these are literally hundreds of clips, you know, um, hundreds of photos and videos and audio recordings. So, um, Try to sit down at a computer, you know, and bang that out onto a timeline. You're not gonna, you're gonna be lost. You're not gonna know where to start. Um, so that takes us back to, like I was saying last week, having your your material outlined and having an edit decision list. Now here's an outline, um, so you get some kind of an idea of what I'm talking about. But basically, the working process I came up with for this particular project. Um, it's very, you know, it's, it's a creative process. It's, this is not, um, you know, I'm not working in a factory. I'm not design, you know, trying to build whatever. No, I'm, this is a creative process. So even though I came up with an edit decision list, like we talked about last week, um, an edit decision list is, it's a draft. It's, an, it's just a place to get your thoughts out on paper of a way that you might edit something. And let's just linger on this for a moment here. Um, so this particular project, I thought, okay, I wanna start like a sort of a traditional documentary style. I'm gonna start um, with a voiceover. I'm gonna talk about, um, you know, just what a crazy year that was, 2020, and how intense it was, and what a nightmare it was, et cetera. And I'm, you know, I'm gonna put that over images that, that kind of poetically tell that story, but not over your, you know, hitting you over the head with it. You know, it's, it's more like an interpretation, you know. So it's more, in other words, it's not blatant. So I have images that more give you the feeling of emptiness, of loneliness. I'm not necessarily showing, you know, people in the hospital or waiting in a line to get a shot, you know, not yet. Not right, not right away. So, so my idea started there. Like I want to start creatively easing people into the feeling because this is more what this video is about. It's not going to be a, the whole thing is not going to be a straightforward documentary. It start out. It starts out that way maybe. You know, because then I I go into shots of the street. I show the neighborhood how empty it looks. I show signs of this place and that place are closed. I'm going to show you that in a second too. By the way, don't worry. Um, you know, it's it's going to get to that point, but at some point, it's going going to try to get weird. That's my that's that's my goal. I just, um, because you know, uh, at some point, we all got kind of. Um, I think everyone uh, was put to the limit. You know, everyone everyone last year, maybe even still, is kind of strained. You know, it's just mentally, spiritually, etc. 
and you reach a point where strange things happen. So for me, I had a weird dream. Um, I had a very a strange dream where I dreamt of it. <laughs> Just to give you a taste of the dream, I dreamt that nurses were all fighting each other. It was a fist fight of a bunch of nurses, and you know that was just one part of the dream. So um, anyway, so that's once I start go, going into that territory of my psychic state, I want the video to kind of start looking uh, disjointed and a kind of a mosaic of a, just a bunch of images that just jar against each other and they can be really different and disjointed, you know, just things that if you didn't know I was talking, for example, if I didn't tell you this is about COVID, you'd be like, what does this have to do with that? But since you know it's about COVID, you know it's about state of mind, hopefully that will make sense. So anyway, that was, that was kind of like the sketch of the project in my head. And so, so having that in mind, I came up with, like I said, the two things. I came up with an outline. So the outline kind of gets, gets those things out on paper, um, the outline for this particular project. And as the outline went along, um, it got more and more abstract. Um, it started to get, well, you know, you could maybe see here, and I have this also digital version that we can look at. Um, started going from descriptions to actual dialogue, uh, a two column situation there, um, where on the left it, it is uh, two characters, we'll call them, um, talking to each other. And so that's done as a voiceover. And then on the right side, it's showing you what the visuals are. So it's almost like a script, and, and yet it's just an outline. Um, and so the outline was my way of like trying to figure out, okay, how can I use all these images? I want to illustrate them somehow. So I don't want to just show images and have a standard voiceover. I want it to be a little, like I said, more poetic, a little more dramatic. Um, so I decided I will, you know, put two characters in this talking to each other. And at the moment, it's just myself. I, don't, I haven't gone out and found two people who, are, who have good voices, who can like act this out. So I just used myself, I recorded myself, and I just varied the audio. So one voice is a little more bass than the other. The other is done in, a, in sort of an echo chamber. So you hear you know, two somewhat different voices. And here you can see that you know I'm drafting this out. Um, as it was going along, I was making changes. I have a whole section I was going to do about Black Lives Matter there at that point in time. And then I realized, no, that's too soon to show that. So I drew a box around it, and I slashed through it, and I put an arrow going down. I'm not sure where I'm going to put it, but I'm going to place it later. And meanwhile, I'm going to develop this stream of consciousness a little more with these two characters and um, go from there. And so, you know, it's kind of like a, a, a dance between the outline and the edit decision list. They kind of develop together in tandem. So that was this particular project. I'm not saying all projects are like this, but um, you know, mostly I'm just trying to say this is this is a creative process. You have your probably have your you will have your own way to do it. So maybe you'll put things on little cards, and maybe you'll put the cards all over the wall, or tape them on the wall, you know, or on the floor, and you'll move them around, and you'll figure out, yeah, this is a good order. And then, you know, someone will open the window and the window will blow it and all over the place and you'll have to start all over. <laughs> so so that's, the way, that's the way editing works is something always kind of gets, you know, throws a mon monkey wrench into it and you have to start all over again. So if you, um, if you can't handle total, uh, you know, sabotage of your editing process, then you probably don't want to be an editor because everybody who edits long term goes through this it's like at some point you've been working all night on something and then your hard drive you know fries and dies or whatever or the power goes out and you've lost six hours of work you know and so then you really just have no choice but to pick yourself up and start over again from zero um now now usually you know we 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 advise people to not let that happen um, by doing a save often, so save often. Um, there's all kinds of little practices that we talked about last time, you know, to make it go better for yourself. So, so saving your project often, naming things properly, 
um, having a plan, having some kind of concrete plan, but also not getting bogged down. And this is something that I sometimes struggle against. So when you're editing, there's certain steps that you do. And so let's say you've done all this preparation work. Let's say, okay, I, I've got my stuff on paper. I've got my clips logged. I've got them put into nice, nicely named folders on my hard drive. Um, you know, I understand a folder structure, for example. So I know that for video, it's going to be found on your little SD card. It's going to be found in all these folders that you're seeing on your screen here. So, you know, AVCHD and Stream, et cetera, BDMV. And then you're going to put them in sensible places. So you're going to make your yourself folders, name them nicely that makes sense, and put them in there. So let's say I did all that. I've done all this prep work. I think I'm ready to edit now. So I finally, you know, sit at the computer, plug everything in. You import all your footage into the computer, um, into your project, you know. And then if you're working within, well, any, actually any nonlinear editing system, you're going to have to make another folder, you know, environment there. You're going to have to go and create folders to put things into because um, unfortunately, just because you put them in folders, the original material in folders on your hard drive, doesn't mean it's gonna, you're gonna be able to bring all those folders in as is into your editing system, especially elements. With elements, no, you have to make your own folders to put them into. So um, why don't we take a look at elements for a minute here. And um, that way I can give you a little tour of what, what I'm talking about. Um, so you're going to go into your assets panel. Eventually, this is where everything's going to end up. And this can be sized to whatever size you need. So um, here I have created a folder for photos. I've created a folder for videos. I've created music folder, graphics folder, voiceover folder. Okay. Now, within each of these folders, there are other folders. So in the, fo the Photos folder, uh, there's Black Lives Matter photos. So let me open that up. See, there's a bunch of those. As you can see, a lot of photos. Um, and you can collapse them, of course, by clicking the little arrow. Uh, prison Industrial Complex photos. Sometimes this arrow doesn't like to do anything. So when that happens, I just double-click the folder. Oh, my fold, my pictures are missing. Okay, so I have some, I have some work to do with my workflow. I, maybe I forgot to bring those in. Then I've got another folder called Life Adjusted. I got that abbreviated. You know, we had to all adjust our lives, and we still are for COVID. So you know, there's stuff in Chicago. You know, you'll you'll see those in a minute. Uh, Miami, that's one of the places I went last year. Uh, O'Hare Airport. Um, you know, what that looked like in the worst part of the pandemic. Uh, Pilsen, so we got a lot of photos from Pilsen, uh, and so on and so forth. So those are the photos and other things too. Nature and um, politics, so we've got some stuff related to the election. Um, there was so much going on. And then I need to go back up, so I'm going to go back up. And that, so that's photos, and then video, same thing. It's a whole other, um, it's a whole other maze, a whole other labyrinth of stuff. You know, there's protest footage, there's um, other forms of the the photos, but in video, uh, nature by itself has four different categories. So out west, and Spears Woods, which is near Chicago, Goose Lake, Southside Chicago. A lot of good stuff here. So, you know, I wanted to get everything represented. So I put it into all these folders. But before I put them in the folders, I named them. You know, I, I, I advised people do that last week. So, or not last week, last workshop. Um, that you give them names. Because if I open up, let's say I open up some of these videos. I look at some of my protest footage, for example. Uh, they've, got, they've already got names on them. I didn't have to spend more time naming them here in Elements. If you just bring in raw camera numbers, then you're going to have to spend some time renaming them here. And then that's complicated too, because then you're not necessarily uh, having, you're not, you don't have the same name in elements as you do on the hard drive. And so if these two files, if this file goes offline, sometimes relinking it can be tricky because 
you're trying to relink it to some obscure camera number as opposed to, oh, let's see, um, Black Lives Matter Pilsen POV went offline. I can find that clip on my hard drive because that's the name of it over there. So it's good to, I'd say, it's good to, in my opinion, name it first uh, before you bring it into Elements or any other nonlinear editing program, if you can. There's other times, like I said, where you don't have time to name every single clip. Well, uh, time or the inclination, you may not need to. Um, and so then just bring them in as a batch and make a folder of the name of that batch. There you go. That might be your workflow. That could work. So, okay, so all the prep work uh, is still not over. I still can't edit yet until I've edited these clips, I've put these clips into these folders and named these folders and so on and so forth. So, okay, that's done. The clips are in there. Now, the next step is to make what you call an assembly edit. So, assembly edit, I'm going to show you that. Um, if, yeah, I think you can see my timeline. Um, assembly edit is where you just want to put it on the timeline. You're just grabbing a bunch of clips and in the order that you planned. So, you got to look at your plan. You got to look at your edit decision list or your outline. Follow that. It can change. You don't have to be, you know, subservient to this paperwork. You know, you can decide I'm going to make a few little changes because now that I'm seeing it on the timeline, it's not making as much sense as it made on paper, but um, that's fine. That's part of the process as well. That's what I like about editing is it's, it's like a, a sculpture. You know, it's you're sculpting with, with ones and zeros, you're sculpting with uh, digital material. And you're, you're not necessarily going to uh, know what it looks like yet. You just have a rough idea. So you get your chunk of stone and, you know, you hew off some big chunks off the corners because you know you don't want corners on it. But, you, you know, so you've got a rough idea of its shape. And then you're going to go from there. So there's your, um, your concept for assembly edit. So the assembly edit can also be uh, several passes. It doesn't have to be a single pass. Um, down on the timeline here, it's all on one track right now, except for a few titles on the top. And some of these titles um, have to do with being placeholders. And that means that you might not have a certain piece of footage yet. Um, you might need to add it later. Maybe you forgot where it was. You, have, you, know, you need to find it. Um, you know, so you might want to make a little graphic, making a note of that. Like here, this is telling me I need to place music in the mute in the bed until until we reach black, because I put a piece of black um, after a certain uh, number of clips to to symbolize the end of the, a segment. So okay, that's where I want music to go, and so I made myself that note. Um, so I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to play this. I'm going to blow it up big. I'm going to play it. And that way you get an idea of what this is looking like. It's really rough right now. Um, it's going to definitely need a lot of work, but this is this is very helpful to at least get on the timeline in a particular order um, that can be rearranged later in the next step. And so right now you're not worried about how rough it is. So here goes. I'm going to go ahead and, and put this full screen. Because this part, I'm planning on putting music over this. And at a certain point, a title. So as you can see, these, these shots kind of go on for a long time. And so that's OK. Um, I just kind of picked a rough order for these shots. I thought, OK, this shot flows well into that shot, and so on and so forth. And later, I will reduce how long they are. I will trim them down. And they'll flow a little quicker. And maybe I'll even do that into the beat of the music. But for now, this is good enough. This is good enough. I have got all these shots. I'm laying them on here. It's going on way too long, I know. So that's one of my tasks is to reduce that. Um, so if you wanted, you could do more paperwork. You can bust out another sheet, uh, blank edit decision list, and make notes on it saying, I need to shorten these shots. OK, see, as you can see, I'm telling myself I need to put the main title here. So I'm going to be putting a title there later um, and shortening all this. OK, I'm going to probably see. Let me see if I can go a little faster here because, yeah, we don't have all day here. This is, this is a, a workshop, so let me jump ahead a little. OK, so then it goes into shots. Ah, OK, this is where um, I'm putting a note to myself that this is where I should begin my voiceover.
<clears throat> which at this point I had not recorded yet. Um, later, I mean, earlier today, I recorded this voiceover. <laughs> so yeah, this is where the voiceover is going to begin. And the voiceover has to do, like I said, with putting people in the right frame of mind about all this. So looking at my edit decision list and my outline, it'll tell me what did I decide. Okay, so I decided to do a voiceover saying something about if you are watching this, then you have survived the year 2020. And if you are old enough to remember it, then you remember what a lonely year it was, the year of the COVID-19 pandemic, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. So that's gonna go over these particular images. Um, I decided to make these images still, still images, because with that and some, you know, some kind of um, uh, alienating kind of music, some urban alienated kind of music, um, I think that would, those would go well together. All these empty spaces, still images, nothing, nothing is moving, literally. So I thought this would be good um, for a little while to show these images. And then moving on to something, you know, uh, with actual video moving, so we're, it's gonna have to segue somehow um, to something. Okay, these are expressionistic kind of images. Um, that happened after the intro with the masks. The earth is literally scorched here to suggest like devastation. Um, but even so, it doesn't say enough by itself. So I'm planning on putting a recording of a voiceover that starts here and runs kind of periodically throughout the whole piece. It'd be like a dialogue between two guys commenting on life under COVID with some expressionistic guitar notes here and there. And so you're kind of getting, maybe hopefully getting the idea of the concept I'm going for. But I'm going to show you the rough cut in a few moments here. And the rough cut um, will definitely give you a better idea. So, okay, these images go on a little too long. Here's some new images for you guys. Um, just more landscapes, um, barren, empty, you know. Um, these two characters are going to be talking about how did it feel, you know, do you remember... The shock, the feeling of shock, yes. How about the disbelief, yes. Did it feel surreal to you? Yes, it still does. Why? What was so strange about it? Everything, everything was strange about it. You know, it was just a really weird year. So that's the voiceover um, that we will hopefully be hearing when I play the rough cut. Um, these are some more stills, so you're not going to hear much in the way of sound with these. Um, here I meant to put a photo of my cat. This was another part of the trauma for me last year as I lost my cat. I want to put him in my video. There's another trauma right there. <laughs> we had a lot of reasons to feel traumatic last year, a hell of a lot of reasons. So, you know, images of alienation and trauma and emptiness and dis dis despair. Um, but anyway, you keep on going with that. You, you, you just hash it out. You just take all your images, you put them on the timeline, and you create an assembly edit. Um, so let me jump ahead a little. I'll just take you visually through some of this assembly edit. And, um, you know, we've got people waiting for buses. We've got uh, commentary in the car. Uh, the radio's on, talking about, you know, are they ever going to develop a vaccine, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so there's a lot going on there. The sound is really choppy. Um, so I'm not worried about that, though, at this point. Um, at this point, the audio is not an issue so much. It's more something to take note of. It's something to start making some notes about. Like I might want to use some of the wild sound from that audio. Um, and sometimes I might just want it to have be low in the background, especially if I have a voiceover going on. Um, there may also be some music. I might bring some music back into this. So yeah, the audio is a whole other register. It's a whole other universe. And so if you can't worry so much about the audio at this point. You know, the, the assembly edit is about just the rough assembly. Get your raw materials lined up, 
you know, and then you're going to start polishing it. You're going to start taking your hammer and your chisel and hewing it down into something that makes a lot more sense. It looks more polished. It is a long process, though, with a project like this. Now, of course, there are simpler projects, simpler projects that don't require nearly so much, you know, labor intense effort. Um, so, you know, it really does depend. But in this case, yeah, the audio is going to be a huge, huge task. It's going to require um, days of work, you know. And there's, and just like with everything else, it is a multi-layered thing. It has a lot of uh, levels to it, and so there's always a first pass, and then a second pass, and maybe even a third and a fourth pass. You know, you have to kind of refine it and refine it and refine it. You keep doing it until it gets down. Uh, to what you're looking for. So as I mentioned, there are images of people in, you know, dealing with all the problems that cropped up during COVID. Maybe some of you guys remember, you know, the National Guard, the National Guard like blocking certain intersections. So yeah, um, something worth uh, including in your video. Uh, just trying to go to the grocery store was a hassle. And then when you get there, you wait in a long line outside with the, you know, everything boarded up um, with a mask on. So all of this has been a big adjustment. So I'm trying to do justice to a complex project. And here, you know, there were uh, protests, protests going on. You know, I don't want to make light of this. this. This was an intense year and it was all related, you know, um, after George Floyd was murdered by police after Breonna Taylor was killed, you know, people were angry, um, and rightfully so. So, yeah, people got out into the streets. And so I got out there and I documented some of that. Um, so it's, it's, maybe it's too much for this project. I might discover that I bit off more than I can chew with this project, you know. Um, maybe this should just be done as segments. And that's another thing about cable access, CAN TV, you can do a limited run miniseries, for example, and so maybe I should reconsider this, this, this project, this workflow, and divide it up into smaller chunks. But then I wouldn't get to do necessarily the, the concept I was saying where um, I have a strange dream and, you know, things are getting really weird and, um, you know, that's that's something that I might have to sacrifice. Yeah, here's people taking a knee over at the at the Cook County prison. A um, lot of stuff to talk about here. So I'm going to jump ahead though, because we don't have all day to look at the raw footage. Um, I'm going to try to jump ahead past all the murals to this rough cut. You know, this is this is a good experiment too, because you know when I when I went to film school. Um, and I was in my uh, a 16 millimeter film class with a Russian, you know, instructor, and he was really tough. Um, he forced us to watch each other's films. All the, the students in the class it was like 30 students, and he would force us to watch a student's work over and over and over again. And it was silent. Most of the class was all done with making silent film projects. And we just had to learn to analyze it with our eyes. And it's like, you know, learning the rhythm of it. And so that's something else um, that you can do um, is turn off the audio and look at the way that it flows visually. And that can also be a, a thing that can guide you as far as making uh, creative decisions goes. So here, I'll go ahead and play this because you did see that opening segment, how long it was, how slow it was. Let's see what it looks like now that I've chopped it down a bit so you should hopefully if, if you were watching you should notice quicker rhythm going on yeah you can see there you get you get a feel for it you get a feel for there's a quicker rhythm going Flows better, um, and then the opening title should be coming up in a minute now. There we go. And then we're going to fade to black. And this is another part of your rough cut. Uh, your rough cut is where you start to trim things down, you shorten things, you make them flow better. Um, you do you put transitions as you see a fade, fade to black. 
I'm going to be pause for a second, everybody, because I'm getting a question. What's the question? All right. We want to know specifically, you personally, do you buy your own audio effects? Or and if you do, where do you go to? And also, what is your thought process when you, as you edit personally? As far as audio effects go, um, two answers to that question. Depends on the project. Most of the projects that I like to work on, I like to create my own audio effects. I, I really enjoy that. It's called making Foley's. Um, I'm going to see if I can play any Foley's here because um, I recorded a lot of sounds using the digital audio recorder that we have here at Can TV, which looks like this. It's called a Tascam. Um, nice quality digital audio on the Tascam. Um, so yeah, it's something you can check out, take out into the field, or you can go into the, the booth. We have a little audio recording booth here, and you can uh, get some nice, clean, quality audio with that. And we can show you how to use that if you're not sure. So um, I also have my own equipment, too. So I like to go out with a shotgun mic and headphones, and, and I go out and record sounds out in the field. And then I put them together. And I also like to experiment with the audio with a nonlinear, with a, uh, sorry, a digital audio workstation. Uh, so that's software like uh, Pro Tools. Um, mine is not Pro Tools. I have something called Studio One. Um, so yeah, I like to layer it and filter it and experiment with it and do th interesting things with it. So, uh, but but we have a whole library of sound effects here at Can TV that our producers have access to. So if you are a Can TV producer you can use that sound for a project that's going to be on CAN TV. And that can actually be accessed uh, on any, almost any computer here at CAN TV. We, we have the, um, the account uh, hooked up. So you can download onto your own hard drive. You can come in with a hard drive. I mean, it's tons of stuff. It's thousands and thousands of recordings. So great, great stuff. Now, as far as how I feel about it, um, you go through a lot of feelings with editing. Most of it is tedious, to be honest. It's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of paperwork. It's a lot of organizing. It's a lot of thinking, a thought process behind it. Um, but that's, that's how it is with anything, really. If you're building a piece of furniture, same thing. You have to go through the tediousness of designing it and drafting it and then measuring the wood and so on and so forth. So, you know, it's tedious. But, um, but then it starts to flow. It starts to get to a point where it becomes very enjoyable, um, especially if you've done your work properly and you've organized things properly and you have access to everything and your equipment is working right. That really helps. It starts to become fun. You know, start to enjoy it. But then, again, you always come up against some other tedious task that needs to be done. So this is not exactly... It's, you have to have the right mentality for it, I guess. Um, there are people who do it for a living. Um, you know, I don't edit for a living, so when I edit, it tends to be enjoyable because I'm not having to do it for somebody else. That's the other thing. If you have to do it on a deadline, it's not as fun. <laughs> well, yes and no. Some people thrive under pressure. So sometimes a deadline is the best thing you can have um, because then you feel excited. You've got to get it done. It's got to be done by midnight tonight. So hopefully that answers that question. So let me go back to my timeline and show you where I was going with this. This, this was our little visual slide sequence of stills before. Remember, they were like long, kind of interminably long. And maybe they're still a little bit long here, but um, part of the rough cut process is to shorten these, make them flow better. It again, it depends on your project. Say it's a music video. If it's a music video, then obviously sometimes you really want these mo these 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 images to, to pop and boom, 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 just really fly by, sometimes in fractions of a second. But that's not what I'm trying to uh, show at this particular point in time. So um, after all this happens, we get back to here and back to our sequences. 
And these sequences, I have shortened quite a bit a lot of these shots. These two shots here are actually parts of the same shot. Um, so I've chopped them down. Now, how do we do this? I mean, being efficient is really important. So with your um, certain habits that you form are important. And so uh, one thing that I do a lot is I use keystrokes on my keyboard. So let's say I need to insert a bunch of shots at this point. Here's our shortcuts for keyboard shortcuts. Um, you can always bring that up in the help menu of your software. Just type in shortcuts and you'll get that. Let's say at a certain point here, I feel like I need to insert a bunch of material. Um, so I'm gonna go find the material. Let's say it's a bunch of videos. I'm gonna throw in some nature footage, for example. All right, um, let's, let's see, let's see. I'm gonna go out west here, Yellowstone, okay. Let's say I want oh, this shot and that shot and those two shots. I'm holding down my control key, so that's a keystroke on my keyboard. I'm just picking different shots that I want. Now those are ready to go to insert on the timeline simply by dragging that entire group to the timeline. I drag and drop and you have to line it up right. So you might wanna make sure your snapping tool is turned on. It looks like my snapping tool is not turned on. It's too slippery on my timeline here. So I'm not gonna drop those yet. First, I'm gonna go make sure my snapping tool is turned on. I'm gonna type the letter S for snapping. Now I'll try to do that again. I'll drag them. Yes, see now it's snapping to things. I'm going to put it in front of this other footage and let go. Now I'm going to close the assets panel. I'm going to zoom out with the minus key, another keystroke, so you can see that group that I just inserted on the timeline. So that's a way to just quickly drag and drop a bunch of material onto your timeline. Now let's say it's just, um, I need to get to another spot here and I need to insert a shot over there somewhere. Well, a good thing to do is to use the page down key. So I'm paging down, 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 down until I get to the spot. Let's say it's right here at this, right here at this black. I'm gonna zoom in on that so I can make sure I'm at the right place. So plus, 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 there we go. We got black video there. And uh, I realize, oh, okay, I don't wanna put it before the black. I wanna put it after the black. So I'm gonna page down one more time. And there we go, my playhead is in position at a cut point. So now I go get, you know, whatever shot it is. Um, I'll just randomly pick something at this point. Normally you're gonna follow your plan. You're gonna follow your plan and find something that is relevant. Uh, we already saw Chinatown. And by the way, when you already use a piece of footage, nice thing that most editing programs do is they show you that it's already been used. So even though I have hundreds of clips on my timeline, I can see these little green dots are showing me that I've already used these particular shots. So, oh, okay, I'm not gonna use that by accident again. I, I'll, I'll not bother to take those. Um, I'm gonna take a question in just a moment, folks. So let me just finish this one point I'm trying to make and then we'll take a question. Let's say I want this, this particular clip right here. I open it up, I double click it, and I like to see things bigger, so I, make this bigger. And then I have two choices here when I'm working on my rough cut. I can either trim it in this preview panel and then bring it to the timeline, or I could, I could have just, like you saw a minute ago, take it down straight to the timeline and then worry about trimming it later down on the timeline. So really quickly, I'll just show those two different methods. So let's say I prefer the method, I actually do prefer the method where you prepare it first in this uh, preview panel before you bring it down. So I'm hitting spacebar to play it. I could also do JKL, so I'm gonna hit L a few more times. And those of you that have used Elements know that JKL doesn't always work the first time. There we go, I've got it. I got it to work now. So I can jump ahead and I can find a shot that I'm interested in, uh, a moment I'm interested in, okay? And then I can make an out point by hitting the letter O. And then I will take it back to a spot that I like as an endpoint. Say right there, I hit K to stop, make an endpoint I. Now I don't have to actually drag this down to the timeline. This is the way some people do it, but for an efficient workflow, I wanna do it as fast as possible. So I could insert it on the timeline just by hitting the comma key. And there we go, I hit comma and then insert it on the timeline. Let me undo that, control Z, so you can see it again in case, in case you missed it. I'm hitting the comma key, there it goes. It inserts it where the playhead is on the timeline. 
So the main thing there is to make sure that playhead is at a cut point. You don't want it to be uh, accidentally in the middle of a shot. So here, if I put this playhead in the middle of a shot over here, okay, it's in the middle of this footage with this Humvee right here. Okay, now if I go back to my preview panel and I hit comma, <laughs> of course it's not working now. Let me try this again. There we go. Okay, it put it in the middle of that Humvee shot and chopped that Humvee in half. And, you know, see there's the Humvee, then this other footage, then the Humvee again. So it cut that into two pieces. So you have to be careful where you put this playhead before you insert on the timeline. So I'm going to undo Control Z. And this time I'll place it more cor correctly. So I will page down to a spot. Let's say right there, it's a cut point. I come back to my preview panel, I hit comma. See, it's, it's a little sticky. That's the thing with this cheap software. You know, Elements is, is not expensive, so you get what you pay for. Keys don't always do what they're supposed to. But anyway, just by moving this playhead around a little bit, I hit the comma, boom, it worked. It insert the footage without chopping any of the other clips on the timeline. Um, so you can do that over and over and over again. Let me start fresh, actually. I'm gonna go to the end real quick and demo that. So let's say I've done in and out points on a clip. Okay, I've done in and out points. I'm gonna put it on a timeline. I can hit period at this point because there's nothing around it. So period is like an overlay edit. I can keep hitting period. Let's see what happens. I'm putting more and more, you know, instances of that on the timeline. So this is good if you're doing something that requires repetition, the shot to go over and over and over like looping. Just keep hitting period. But anyway, let's say I didn't want to. I just put the one time. I'm going to go get another shot, load that in, make my in and out points. Let's say really quickly, I'll just find a spot I like, like right here, make an in point, go find a spot for an out point, say right there, out point, hit my comma or period, boom, it puts it on the timeline. I go find another shot, same thing, over and over and over again. We can keep doing this, and it's a quick way to edit. I'm going to just find my out point for this. And there we go. And I'm going to hit period. Boom. Puts it on a timeline. So I can just keep on building forward like this. And right now I just sloppily put in and out points. You know, um, you, uh, I'm, I'm just doing a rough cut. I'm just, or actually it's an assembly edit example again. So I'm just assembling it together. Not worrying about the precision of the in and the out points. I'm just making in and out points. Boom, putting them down on the timeline. Keep moving, keep moving, keep getting other chunks. So this is one workflow where you prepare it first in the preview panel, then take it down to the timeline and keep on going. The other method was go grab a bunch of clips that you, you know you're gonna need. Follow your plan if you have a plan. Uh, you know, just go down the line, pick the clips that you have on your plan. Um, I'm just gonna simulate that right now. Pick your clips. Put them on your timeline. Close your asset panel. Get that out of the way. Um, close this as well. That's your preview panel. You need to you need to work. You need room to work. You don't want your screen cluttered. So a lot of editing has to do with making it comfortable for you. So using, you know, arranging things on your screen so they're comfortable. Um, putting things in a rapid fashion um, in a way that works best and makes best sense for you. Um, using quick keys. These are all going to help you edit. So now that I've thrown, thrown down a cluster of raw clips onto my timeline, I can now go to the timeline. I can kind of like scrub through. Say I'm scrubbing through this footage really quickly. I can scrub through and decide, do I want this entire shot? No, not necessarily. Let's, okay, we only have a few minutes left, guys. So I'm going to wrap up this point and um, call it a day. So anyway, let's say this is where I want the shot to start. I put, I leave my playhead there and then I trim on the timeline. I use my little trim bracket and I trim to that spot. And I've used the snapping uh, tool. The snapping tool uh, makes it easy for me to trim to where I left the playhead. Um, I take the end of the clip, drag it over. When it reaches that spot where the playhead is, it snaps there. I'm done. I've trimmed the shot. So I could do this with all the rest of these other shots. Now you may notice that some of these clips here are, are short on the timeline. That's because they have been pre-trimmed because you saw me doing that just a few minutes ago. So let me open one of these up. If you double click on the timeline, it opens up 
that clip into a preview panel. And then in the preview panel, you can see, oh, look, there's already an out point there, uh, or an in point, rather. That's an in point. There's an out point somewhere else down the line here. Um, that has already been trimmed, but I could do some more trimming now that I've reopened this shot up if I want to. I can, like, adjust that in point. See, you can see how it d did the same thing down here on the timeline. It made the shot shorter. I can, I can trim it by doing that, but then I also have to close this gap. I have a gap here, and it's not easy to right-click in this gap, but I did manage to do it. If it's a small gap, it's hard. So anyway, you hit delete and close gap, it closes the gap. So that's the disadvantage to trimming on the timeline, is that you end up with gaps, unless you use another keystroke, which is, I believe, control, to trim and not leave a gap. So here I'm going to talk about making multiple passes to adjust your audio. So you start by putting your playhead before the section that you want to adjust. In this case it will be easy because there's only two sounds here. Track 1 has the live audio recorded by the camera of the footage that we see here. And the other track is the music which I've placed down below. So. We want to start by opening up the audio mixer, which is here under Tools, Audio, Audio Mixer. So open up the audio mixer and decide how many channels you want to display. If you want to see all of these tracks, fine. If not, you click on this and show high tracks. And then pick which tracks you want to display. So in this case, I want to see Audio 1 and my music. So I'm going to kill everything else and see just Audio 1 and music. There we go. So we just have two faders to deal with now. It's easier on the eyes. I can also close the tool box, get that out of the way. It's all about getting comfortable and getting yourself in a good position. And so then I can um, hit play with the space bar. And as it plays, I can adjust and the first pass is actually not necessary to use the fader. The first pass is just to see what the levels are when you play. And you see that the level is very low. Let me back up a little bit first because um, I originally kind of fixed this already to get it in the ballpark so that it would be easier to mix. So first I'm going to go ahead and undo what I had previously done. I'm going to right click on the clip, go to clip. Audio gain, as you can see, it's set to minus seven, so I'm going to put it back at zero where it used to be. And as you can see now, it's a lot louder. It's jumping up to even higher than zero. So the first step is from scratch, right clip on it, go clip, audio gain, and since I figured it was roughly six or seven decibels too high, I'm going to you know, type in minus seven and hit OK. And as you can see, the waveform shrunk down, so it's visually showing me what's going on. Now I'm ready for mixing, so I can do fades and things like that and ride the levels. So I'm going to hit play, come over to my music, bring up the fader, and bring it up if I need to. I can anticipate when the sound is getting too loud, but when I see the waves approaching, so I can start to bring it down. So I'm just writing my levels up and down, trying to get a good level going. So for music, this is easy. I can just leave this fader here. It's in the latch mode, so I don't have to constantly click your mouse and bring it up and down. I can just leave it there and let it play. Let it play in real time and let it go in real time because if I stop right now it won't write any more keyframes. Okay so now I'm fading out as the image fades out and this is another track. Now this track is not being displayed so I would have to go to the uh, show hide again and display that particular track. I don't have any more music so I don't, might not need that but I'll just leave it for now. And so then I'm going to open this up a little so I can see all three tracks. And since I don't have music, I'll just crop it out, actually. Um, so Audio 1 and Voice. 
audio one is the sound recorded by the camera. Now these are stills here, so actually in this section I don't really have to worry about audio one. Probably the only thing I have to adjust is that voiceover. So I'm going to go ahead a little bit to a section that has both voiceover and the camera audio. And as you can see here, I've already done a pass or faded down this audio because it was too loud. And so let's see the voice. So you can see that that has also been adjusted. Uh, so each of these has been a separate pass because I only have one mouse and I can't grab both faders at the same time and adjust them both at the same time. So I had to make two passes, one for the voice and the other for the voiceover. Um, the voiceover in this case is the most important audio. So for that, I would want to mute the other tracks so I can just adjust the voice over accordingly. So again, I'm going to play it and listen to it. How about the disbelief? And as necessary, bring it up. Now, for some reason, I'm still hearing track yes. one. I don't know why I muted it. Did it feel surreal to you? It's kind of strange. Yes. I'm not sure what's going on there. It's still. Ah, okay. I think what it is is that I have more than one voiceover track. That's what's happening. So let me look up here and see what's going on. Aha. I forgot about this other voiceover up here above on audio track three. So this is getting more interesting, more three-dimensional. So I need to display audio track three. So back I go to this feature and checking three, hitting OK in a moment here, as soon as I make sure I get everything I need. And just want to simplify it and hit OK. And now I see all the tracks I need. OK. So let me back this up a little. Of course, JKL doesn't work, so I'm just going to grab this little block and scrub over this way. Okay, and it's good to have the tracks open so you can anticipate the audio as it's coming. You can get ready to adjust your faders on the track that you're working on. So the first path is sort of like an analyzing pass, just so you can see what's going on with your meter and your levels. So you hit play. Do you remember the shock when it first And it hit? looks like audio track two needs to come up yes. more. And so does audio track three. Those are the two voiceovers. So I'm going to go ahead and back this up and make a pass. Actually, if it's a global change that I need by a certain amount, and it's better to just use the um, audio gain function. Go to clip audio gain. And it looks like to me like it could use another four decibels or so. So I'm going to go ahead and do that on both of these. Add four decibels. And see if that works. Okay, so now I'm going to do another pass to see if that worked. Do you remember the shock? That's better. It it's almost at minus 12. That's good. Yes. Maybe even a little more. I think a few more decibels wouldn't hurt. And that would give me room to maneuver, to lower or raise the fader. If it's too low, it's not going to give me that kind of maneuvering room. Because, like, you know, the background noise there might drown it out. So I'm just going to go back in, right click, and add another few decibels here, make it oh, about seven. And there we go. Let's see what that sounds like. Do you remember the shot? That's better. The first hit. Yes. yes. Actually, the second track could use a little more. So I'm going to go ahead and give it a few more decibels. Maybe make it nine. And each three decibels that you increase it, you're actually doubling the loudness. Do you remember the shock when it first hit? Okay, yes. yeah, that's good. So I don't even have to use my fader for those. But if I did, I would be writing these levels, which I do have to disbelief. still do a little bit. And the nice thing is, you can see 
the meters on these faders responding to the keyframes that were already written. Now the second voice I didn't get to in time, so I'm going to back it up and play it again and get ready for it. Yes. And bring it in a little more. So I improved it. But as you can see, you have to do like multiple passes. You've got to redo it. It's up to you if you want to redo, if you want to just do the whole segment and then go back and polish some sections. That's not a bad idea. Otherwise, you can spend the whole day just working on 30 seconds of footage or however long. But that's how you do it. You make multiple passes. And then when you're done, you eventually unmute everything so you can hear the mixture of everything together. And you just polish it until it sounds better. And... If you have a point where your sound is rough, like where two cuts, where two, two clips meet, you can put like a cross dissolve there. So let's say this point right here is abrupt. It's really harsh. So you would go to your transitions, you choose audio, and there's only two types of transition here. They both do the same thing. They just do it a little bit differently. So you would just grab one and drop it there and Choose how many seconds you want it to be, where you want it to be lined up, hit done, and that's a cross dissolve. And that helps get rid of clicks. And it helps smooth it out. Now, if you're going to be adding materials in the middle of your edit, you know, you might be thinking, okay, I do need some more footage of such and such. You know, okay, I went out and shot some footage yesterday, actually. Yesterday, I went and got my, sh my vaccine. I got vaccinated. And uh, so I took some uh, video from outside over at the United Center. I got uh, people waiting in line to go inside. It's good visuals. But anyway, so yeah, if you're adding footage in the middle of your, pr of your project, um, let's say from an SD card, you you don't want to um, just bring it straight into your editing project. So work a lot of things having to do with workflow have to do with with things that aren't even creative, things that are just mechanical, things that are tedious. Uh, but this was part of what we talked about last week. You don't want to like just take clips off of your SD card um, straight into your editing program because what happens later when you take your card out of your computer and put it back in your camera? Well, the reference is gone. The, the, the originals are on the card. They're not in the computer anymore, so the computer doesn't know where they are. So, you know, that's offline. That's called offline files. All right, now that all of the prep work has been done, the assembly edit has been completed, the rough cut has hashed everything out, trimmed everything down, positioned everything nicely, brought in some graphics, some transitions, etc. Once it's all done, it becomes finished, and you can call that a fine cut if you're happy with it. So let's take a look at just a little sample, a few minutes of a fine cut of this particular project just to see how things have all come together. If you are watching this, either you have survived the year 2020 or you weren't born yet. Because the year 2020 was really, really? a really insane year. The lonely year it was the year of COVID. COVID-19.
Do you remember the shock when it first hit? Yes. Still feel a little bit of heat here. How about the disbelief? Yes. Did it feel surreal to you? Yes, it did. It, did. it, it still, still does. does. Why? Why? What was so strange about it? Everything. Like cliches coming to life. Everyone kept saying how it felt like we were living in a sci-fi movie. People have died from the virus. New York City remains the hardest hit area. NPR's Rob Stein says not enough testing has been done to Are get a true okay? picture of how the virus is spread. I'm, I'm all right. But some but other folks... Handbrake is, is a um, software that allows you to um, look at the, all kinds of different video clips. You can look at different clips and you can re review them. You can then decide what to do with them. Sometimes you want to transcode them. You want to make them into a, a different file type. Um, Handbrake is one of those softwares that lets you do that. And Handbrake is free, by the way. So if you don't have Handbrake, you might want to look for that online and download that to your computer. It's very user friendly too. So um, that's one of, the, one, of the, one of the softwares I use. There's also um, MPEG Stream Clip. This is an old one. It's an oldie but a goodie. Um, it's, they're, they're all a little bit different, you know, and some of them have better tools for um, viewing or better tools for transcoding. Um, so it really, uh, it's, these are, this is also, it was free. I believe it's still free. Um, it has not been updated for a while though. Yeah, it is still free, but yeah, it's an old software, but it still works. Now this one called Name Changer, Name Changer is like, if you have a large batch of uh, files, then you can rename them quickly and easily. Um, okay, we had a question about Handbrake just come up uh, from a viewer. So um, it's um, it's a user interface, really. I mean, you just bring files into it. You know, you bring files into it. Um, it has a viewer. You can see there's a viewer there. You can watch the footage, and then there's uh, it tells you what format it is, and then there's the target format. So you you tell it what's my target format? What do I want to translate this into? So in a way, this is like trying to translate from Spanish to Italian or to German or French or something, you know. But you want to usually translate it into a um, a format that your software can recognize. So in the case of Adobe, Adobe Premiere, Adobe Elements, um, you'll have to bring up a, you'll have to go to their help menu and ask them for formats. Uh, what are compatible formats? And then you'll know what kind of formats that software can handle. And um, that's your target. So if, if it didn't come into Elements right away or some other program you're using, you know, Try, try to bring it into Handbrake. And, you know, some of these softwares, um, they like certain things and they don't like others. So if it doesn't even want to come into Handbrake, try the other one. Try the MPEG Stream Clip. You know, try different kinds until one of them recognizes it. VLC is also another good one. Um, 
VLC is a free software. It's powerful. Um, it's, it does the same similar things as these other softwares. It's mostly designed as a player. Um, so yeah, I would recommend VLC. Lots, lots of times it won't play in QuickTime. Try VLC, boom, it'll play. You know, VLC is great and it's free. So yeah, you can try these different softwares, see if they work. But we're pretty much out of time today uh, for my, my part of things. Um, if anyone has any more questions, write to us. Give us an email at training at cantv.org. So we're going to wrap it up and say thanks for watching, everybody. My name is Eric Torres, and I, I'm grateful to the entire crew here at CanTV for helping produce this show, and I'm grateful to you all for watching. So thanks, and please comment. Tell us what you thought of this this rough workshop, this uh, rough around the edges workshop that you just experienced today. So thanks, and uh, we'll see you again at another workshop. Bye, take care, everyone. Stay safe.